you have it, all you transistor radio bugs. How'd that one grab you? That... Callie, for heaven's sake, it's almost dark. If you don't hurry up, we're gonna be late for the game. Margie, have you ever tried to fix a fuel pump to a rock and roll beat? Well, I'm sorry it made you nervous. I just thought it was a good chance to get in some practice. It's okay. Forget it. Nothing I can do anyway. At least not, not way out here. Well, I wish you hadn't taken this crazy nowhere shortcut. Boy, this is like Lostville. I know. I goofed. And I'm going to get some help if we're going to get there in time for the kickoff. Hey, didn't we pass a farmhouse about a mile or two back down the road? Yeah, that's right. Back around the curve. Come on, we'll be shorter through those woods. Oh, Howie, look. I don't think we ought to go on that property. Look, you want to get to the game, don't you? Of course I then do. Come on. We should have brought the flashlight. Ah, it isn't working. Batteries are down and I forgot to replace them. been walking for hours. Well, it can't be much further now. Hey, there's a light. That's strange. Campfire way out here in the middle of the woods and nobody around. Kind of creepy, isn't it? Yeah. Hold it right there, both of it. Hey, Dad, what are you made up for? I mean, what's the bit? Hey, now, don't, don't point that thing at us. It could go off. Come on now, who are you guys? What kind of a joke is this? I mean, out here in the middle of... Joke, boy, you think this is a joke? Howie, I'm frightened. Look at him. It's got to be some kind of a gag. This can't be for real. Howie, what's it all about? I don't know. Honey, do as I tell you. You edge around behind me, till I'm between them and you. Then run like the devil. Howie, not alone. Do as I say. What are you two youngins doing out here? Quick, don't let him get away! Run, Marjorie! Head to the car! Stop, boy! I'll
Margie? Margie? I need my ever-loving paycheck. What's the rush? Payday's tomorrow. I know, but Reed said you'd have it for me tonight. Oh, did he now? Yeah, that way I get a couple hours head start on my first vacation in three years. Relax. The girl's on her way up from accounting with it now. Where are you going on this vacation? Some place that can't be reached by telephone, telegraph, teletype, or carrier pigeon. You don't think we'd interrupt your vacation now, do you? <laughs> Why not? You guys did it for the last two years. Jim, nice story you turned in. Well written. Had a lot of punch. When he talks like that, he wants something. As a matter of fact, there is one little favor I'd like to ask you to do before you leave. Uh-oh. Here it comes. As a matter of fact, here it is. The accounting department is certainly coming up with much more interesting figures lately. See you guys. Oh, come on, Jim. Well, this will just take a few minutes. It's not much out of your way. All you have to do is get a few details and phone them in from there. From where? Carver Street Hospital. Murphy called in from police headquarters, and some college kid was brought in with a gunshot wound. Here's his name. Why doesn't Murphy cover it? He's on police tonight. He's busy on the cat burglar story. Who shot the kid? That's what I want you to find out. May not be anything in it, but you never can tell. Okay, I'll do it. But afterwards, I'm leaving for my vacation. Definitely, irrevocably, and finally. Do you read me, Great White Fathers? Only too clear. Have a good time. I intend to. Hello, blonde girl. Why, James Crandall, what brings you here? Now, don't tell me. Let me guess. They sent you down for an egoectomy. A what? An egoectomy. They're going to cut out that big, fat ego of... Oh, that's funny. Mm -hmm. Funny, funny. I want some information. Like what? Like, uh, you got a boy here. Howard Ellison, college kid. In some kind of shooting scrape. That's the kid they brought in this evening but I don't think he's having visitors. Well, could I speak to his M.D.? Mm-hmm. That would be Dr. Wilson Blake. Ah, uh, yes. Blake of the Rusty Scabble. Oh, you know him? I should. He broke into me once and stole an appendix. Oh, funny. That's funny, funny. 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 He's in his office. I don't know where he is. Dig you later in the seat. Yes. That's all right with me, Dr. Thornton. 10.30 will be fine. Yes, I think the whole administrative staff should be there. Fine. See you in the morning, Doctor. Goodbye. Come in. Jim Cramble. Hello, Will. How are you? Hey, number one, how about you, sir? No complaints. Can you spare a few minutes? Sure, sure I can. Are you on duty? No, not really. I'm officially on vacation. Soda? Just straight, thanks. I bet you're here for a story on that Ellison boy. Good bet. Sit yourself down. So are some friends of yours. They left about an hour ago. Uh-oh, the local gendarmes, no doubt. Right. Lieutenant Poitain and a couple of his men. They talked to the boy for about an hour, and then finally... Wait a minute. Talk to him? You mean the Ellison kid's able to talk? Sure, he wasn't hurt too badly. The bullet didn't enter any of his vital organs. But the nurse said he couldn't have any visitors. Well, he can't. At least not now. He was too tired after that session with Partain. I want him to get some rest. Well, when can I see him? In the morning. In the morning? But talk, I gotta phone something into the editor. 
I can't fool around on this thing. I'll leave on my vacation tomorrow. Well, I envy you. We're so short-staffed here at the hospital, there's no telling when I'll be able to take a vacation. What did the kid say when he talked? He told a real weird story. The police have a transcript of it. I'd rather hear it from you, if you don't mind. I don't think I should repeat it. I imagine the lieutenant would rather tell you himself. Ah, oh, come off it, Doc. You know Partain's not going to give me anything till he's good and ready. All right. All I can do is repeat what the boy said. But I'll warn you, you won't believe it. Suppose you try me. Well, this Ellison kid is a student at the university, a cheerleader, an honor student, an all-around popular kid. Early this afternoon, he and this co-ed... Co-ed? You mean there was a girl with him? Yes, uh, one of the majorettes from the band, a girl named Margaret DeMar. DeMar? Couldn't be related to Sandy DeMar in the nightclub thrush. As a matter of fact, yes, her sister. Well, that adds a dash of color. What about the girl? I'm getting to that. Now, do you want to hear this story or not? Okay, okay, go ahead. Well, early this afternoon, they left the university on their way downstate to that night game against Southern Tech. They had permission to drive down instead of going on the bus with the other students. They were running short of time, so they took a shortcut on one of those farm roads. Ellison's car started acting up and finally quit on them. They had to have help, so they started walking, trying to make it to a farmhouse. I said, hold it right there. Hey, Dad, what are you made up for? What are you two youngins doing out here? He started running, and that's when he got shot. He got up, and he kept on running. He made it back to the car. He looked around for the girl, and she wasn't there. After that, he blacked out. A passing motorist picked him up and brought him in, and that's the story the way he told it. You sure weren't kidding when you called it weird. I've heard some screwy ones in my time, but this one takes the prize. Yeah, that was exactly my reaction at first. What do you mean, at first? Well, sometimes I'm forced to alter my opinion by certain evidence. I don't know if you're aware of it, Jim, but my hobby is American military history. I collect historical military objects like some men collect stamps. Like this item that was brought in by a patient a couple of months ago. You know what that is? Well, it looks like some kind of rifle slip. Mm-hmm. I have a cigar box full of those at home. My brother and I used to find those in the woods and dig them out of trees when we were kids, back in Georgia, 30 years ago. It was one just like the one you're holding now that I took out of young Ellison's body and gave to the police this evening. And if you ask me, they're going to have to dig a long way back in their ballistics file to find anything that matches that. Yeah? Yeah. You see, that's a mini ball. The kind of a bullet they used during the Civil War.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present our heavenly little headliner and collector of two gold records, the girl with the orchid voice, Miss Sandra DeMar. by myself when I cry And there's gonna be some crying Cause I just told my baby goodbye Get out of here And leave me alone I don't care whether I live or I die Cause my life's already over it ended when you told me goodbye Why is it everything happens to me And my dreams all explode in my face He was my own for a while but he's gone And I know no one can ever take his place So go away and leave me alone I've got a right to my own private pride Coming down with the sorrows Cause I just told my baby goodbye Everything happens to me and my dreams all explode in my face. He was my own for a while, but he's gone and I know no one... Good evening, Lieutenant. Evening, Ramon. No Is this busy at the position? Oh, there's nothing to worry about. We'd like to talk to Mr. Marr with you two singing. Would you get me something while you're waiting? Thank you, no, we're on duty. Leave me alone. I've got a right to my own private cry. I'm coming down with the sun. I just told my baby Are you decent? Yes. Two gentlemen from the police department want to talk to you. Police? Yes, Mr. Mark. I'm Lieutenant Partain, and this is Detective Lasky. We're just making a routine investigation. Have you heard from your sister this evening? Margie? Why no? Why do you ask? Well, we just thought she might have called you. You see, we have reason to believe she may be missing. Missing? I don't understand. She's at a football game in Stephenville with Howard Ellison. I'm afraid not, Mr. Moore. Maybe you'd better sit down and let me tell you all that we know about it so far. Well, Lieutenant Partain, is it a raid or a payoff? Lasky, we got the Walter Winchell, the boondocks again. You've been talking to the DeMar girl? So you know about it already? Yeah, but not enough. Can you fill me in? At this point, you probably know just about as much about it as we do. Why don't you stop by the office in the morning when we have more time to work on it? Ah, oh, come on, Fred. Can't you give me something tonight? I start my vacation tomorrow. Good fishing.
Miss Damar? Yes? I'm Jim Crandall with the Sentinel. Could I talk to you a moment? I'm sorry, Mr. Crandall. I really haven't time to talk. I've got to get home in case my sister calls. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Can I give you a lift home? Thanks, but I'll take a cab. Well, they're kind of slow this time of night. Well, all right, if you're sure it's not out of your way. Of course not. It's part of my job. What's the matter? Mr. Crandall, I'm too upset to go home. You know my sister's missing. Yes. Do you know where it happened? Just about. Would you drive me there? It's nearly one o'clock in the morning. Besides, what if she calls you? If she were going to call me, I'm sure she would have done so by now. It's nearly a 45-minute drive up there. Howie was picked up on a farm road just this side of Stephenville. If it's too much trouble. You can drop me at my apartment and I'll take my car. You're pretty determined to go, aren't if you? If my sister's in trouble, I've got to be near her. Hop in. I need to go up there myself. Lieutenant, we checked that house from top to bottom. Nothing there. Okay, Lasky. As soon as the boys are through, have them go in and get some rest. We've done everything we can do here. Maybe the sheriff and his bloodhounds will turn something up. Right. Lieutenant Partain around. He's up in the woods someplace. Evening, ma'am. Has there been any news of my sister? You're Sandra Damar? Here comes Partain now. Lieutenant, have you found her yet? I'm afraid not. Crandall, what'd you bring her out here for, anyway? I made him bring me, Lieutenant. Can you tell me anything about Margie? No, ma'am. I think you both made a trip out here for nothing. Why don't you go home and get some sleep? He's right, Sandy. You should do as he said. Jim. Somewhere out there in that horrible blackness. It's my sister. Those dreadful dogs. They sound so terribly ominous. Oh, Jim. Come on. We'd better get back. Check all the antique gun shops this morning. As soon as they open. How about the kids' parents? You can contact them. Uh, Lieutenant, the uh, Ellisons live in Denver. I tried all night to call them, but they weren't home. How about a cup of coffee, Jim? Yeah, black. What about the kids at the university? Ellison's fraternity brothers. I talked to everyone in the dorm. They like him. Well, what do his professors say about him? Bright, popular boy. Good scholastic records. Level-headed, down-to-earth, not the kind to make up wild stories. Well, that cracks another one of our little theories wide open. Uh, you just getting here? Some of the other fellows came in a couple of hours ago. Yeah, I was out with the sheriff and his bunch. And have we got a Lulu? Yeah, what is it? The girl's sweater. We found it out in the woods, not far from a smoldering campfire. Go on. Well, we gave the scent to the dogs, and they took off like Moody's goose. Well. We followed them for about a mile or two, till they got through the woods and into a small open space. Well, the dogs got about halfway through the open space, and then they stopped. Well, you've never seen so much confusion of tangled dogs in your life. They didn't know which way to go. The scent had stopped right in the middle of nowhere. It was as if the girl had just been snatched off the face of the earth into thin air. Wait a minute. You mean no footprints, no tire tracks, no nothing? Well, nothing but this. Well, yeah, so you found part of a costume. Costume? Uh-uh. This is the real article. I checked it out. 
What do you mean, checked it out? Look at the label on the inside. McCord Brothers. McCord? Outfitted to the military. Charleston, South Carolina. I checked with the Charleston Department, and they gave me some very interesting facts from one of their newspapers. It seems that McCord Brothers, the company that made that hat, burned to the ground in 1869 and was never rebuilt. It's been non-existent for over a hundred years. This case is getting screwier by the minute, don't it, though? I'll have you run this down to the lab and then go home and get some sleep. How about me, Lieutenant? Sure, sure, go on home. You were under arrest. Well, what do you think? I was Mr. Marr when you left her. She'll go up, naturally. She's spending the night with her girlfriend. Fred, about this whole mess, what's your opinion? I'm not paid to have opinions. I'm paid to put jigsaw puzzles together. But seriously, what do you think? I think there's a logical explanation to everything. Two men were in those woods in costume and makeup. Anyone knows there's lots of guys around nowadays who collect antique guns. They belong to clubs, they have meetings and shooting contests every so often. A couple of them got liquored up a little, wanted to have some fun and scare the kids. But something went wrong. It's as simple as that. My hunch is, as soon as they get up enough nerve, they'll come in, give themselves up. It's a nice theory, Jim, but uh, what happened to the girl? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Jim, you know, this whole thing is, well, it's spooky. Reminds me of something that happened in Germany in 1945, towards the end of the war. Yeah? What was that? Our outfit liberated a small concentration camp near the Alsatian border. When we took it, we expected to find the usual half-starved, ragged inmates. And you can imagine our surprise when we were greeted by about 50 young people. All a picture of perfect health. That sounds a little hard to believe after all I've read of Dachau and Auschwitz. Well, that's what made it hard to figure. Here were these kids, none over 21 and some as young as five, living in apparent luxury. Good food, complete recreational facilities, no forced labor. Remind me of a bunch of calves being fattened up for the kill. You mean there were no old people in the camp? There were a few, but not alive. We found their bodies in the rooms next to the ovens. Apparently we'd taken the camp so fast they hadn't had time to dispose of the bodies. But before they left the night before, they blew up the largest building in the camp. It was some sort of a laboratory. And inside, amidst the rubble and blown into a million pieces, was the scurriest piece of machinery I've ever seen. Some sort of a crazy electronic apparatus. And half buried underneath it amidst the rubble, still strapped to a table, was an old, old man. Just barely alive. Our medics tried to save him, but they couldn't. Now, here's the weird thing. This is the part we could never understand. In trying to identify him, we checked the camp records with the prison number tattooed on his arm. According to those records, that old man should have been an 18-year-old boy. What about the other bodies? Same thing. Their numbers indicated they all should have been kids. What type of experiments were they conducting there? We never found out. Even the young inmates weren't aware of why they were there. They never found the commandant of that camp to bring him to trial with the rest of the Nazi brass. His name was uh, Ernst von Hauser. Did you ever hear of him? Well, he was a German physicist, a contemporary of Einstein's. I don't follow you. You mean you think there might be some connection between all that and what happened here last night? I'm not saying that, no. But just suppose, for the sake of argument, the Ellison kid did see two men out of the past of a hundred years ago. That would mean somebody around here is tampering with time. Somebody was also tampering with time in that concentration camp. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You think that the machine found in that concentration camp was some kind of time machine, and that there may be another one like it around here. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just supposing. After all, they never found Von Hauser. Lieutenant? Yeah, Walt. Captain wants to see in his office. I want you to bring the file on the Maddox case. Be right there. How am I ever going to turn in a story like that? 
That's your problem. Hello? Give me the city desk. Hello, Reed. Crandall again. Would you tell Shaw I'd like to postpone my vacation and stick with the Ellison story? Yeah, that's right. You know that Pulitzer Prize you're always kidding me about? Well, if this thing turns out to be what it looks like, I just might win it. No, nothing new at the moment. I'll keep you posted. Yeah, I've got a little research to do in the library. Then I'm going to the hospital to interview the kid. Right. Talk to you later. All right, Howie, you can go on with your story. That's about it, Mr. Crandall. I remember reaching the highway, and Margie wasn't there. And then I blacked out, and the next thing I knew, I was here at the hospital. And you really don't think, Hallie, that those guys were just a couple of kooks in Civil War costumes? Mr. Crandall, I don't know how to explain it. But I got the distinct feeling that these guys were for real. I mean, like something straight out of Gone with the Wind. Howie, what's your idea of what happened to Margie? Do you think these two guys grabbed her? I don't know, Mr. Crandall. I don't know. That's what's bugging me out of my skull. Nurse, is Mr. Ellison awake? Yes, he is. He has another visitor, but uh, you can go on in. Thank you. Sandy. Hello, Howie. How are you? Hello, Jim. Good morning. Have you heard anything from Margie? Not yet. I brought you some flowers. Thank you, Sandy. I I'm sorry about all this. I mean... It's all right, Howie. Now, don't you worry. Whatever happens, I know it wasn't your fault. Jim, have the police found out anything yet? No new developments. I'm going up there in a little while and have a look around myself. I want to see the place in the daylight. Would you mind if I went with you? Of course not. I'd enjoy your company. Howie, would you forgive us if we ran off right away? Sure. I understand. I'll drop back in later. Bring some magazines. Yeah. True Confessions and Ladies' Home Journal. Gee, thanks, Mr. Crandall. Those are two I never miss. See you later, Howie. Looks like the typical haunted house, doesn't it, Jim? Yeah. The meadow where they found the, the cap and where Margie's trail ended is supposed to be nearby. Do you think this old place has anything to do with her disappearance, Jim? I don't think so. They searched it and didn't find anything. Her sweater was found somewhere in those woods. 
I think I'll have a look around. We better get back to the car. Jim! Oh, the car! It's gone! Jim, someone must have stolen it. I would have heard the motor start up. Besides, I have the key in my pocket. Well, this must be the wrong place. This isn't where we left it. This is where we left it, all right. But it looks different here. There are more trees than there were before. And that fence, that wasn't here when we came down the road. And the barbed wire fence is gone. Jim, we're lost. I don't think so. At least, not the way you mean. Jim, I'm frightened. It's... it's all right. Let me think a minute. This road was paved. And now it's dirt. And there isn't a telephone pole in, in sight. I know, I know. Jim, what is it? What's happening? I don't understand it. Where's the car? Where are we now? Jim, I know you know what's happening to us and you won't tell me. And why not? What's going on? Fantastic. Incredible. I never really believed it. Tell me. Tell me what's happening. Sandy. What's going on? What dreadful Sandy. thing is happening? Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> it 
It'll be all right. Oh. Everything's going to work out. But we have to keep our heads. I believe our best bet is to follow this road and see where it leads. Jim, his clothing. I know. Ours are just as strange to him, especially your short skirt. Friend, what year is this? Where are we? Witchcraft! Witchcraft! Jim. Honey, I don't know how to explain it, but somehow we've been set back in time. But Jim, that's impossible. Impossible? I know it's supposed to be impossible, but it seems to have happened. Well, let's not try to figure it out now. We've got to get somewhere to find some help, some way. Jim, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can go any farther. I simply have to rest. All right. We'll stop for a while. Welcome, my friends. To my little workshop. Do not be alarmed or cause unnecessary commotion. You are in no danger. At least, not for the moment. Won't you please step out? I am Dr. Ernst von Hauser. These are two of my uh, assistants. Monfort? And Wolf. Where are we? I told you. We are in my little workshop. And I tell you again, please do not be alarmed. What time is this? What century are we in? Does it matter, my friend? There really is no such thing as time. Except as a relative measuring device in your own mind. We're not interested in double talk. What happened to Margaret DeMar? What have you done with it? Please, Mr. Crandall, you will please remain calm. What have you done with my sister? Your sister is entirely safe, Mr. Ma, and I assure you, I did not bring her here intentionally. She certainly didn't come here of her own free will. I didn't say that. I brought her here to keep her from harm. Then where is she? Let me see her. Oh, but of course. To the armor. Come and see here. Snell! Bring us the Fraulein de Mar to Ira Schwester. Well. No need for alarm, Mr. Candy. She'll be all right. She'll be able to freshen up. We will even furnish her a change of clothing. I notice you were intrigued. By my servant girl, Didiana. Hmm. And there you might be. Just a few thousand years ago. 
She was serving in the court of Tonk of Menzies, one of the great pharaohs of Egypt. And now she is serving me. <laughs> Quite an experience, is it not? This is like a fantastic nightmare. I don't understand any of it. How did you get Margie here? I was conducting an experiment with a pair of gentlemen from the past. Uh, when the girl and her boyfriend uh, wandered into the machine's field of materialization and encountered them. They shot the boy. They might have killed the girl had I not teleported her here very quickly. And the two red soldiers? I sent them back to Shiloh, Mr. Crandall. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> they probably died there anyway. Fantastic. Utterly fantastic. Tell me, Doctor, why did you send Sandy and me back to... To 1789? I admit I took advantage of you to conduct a little experiment. Oh, you are a little dangerous, but you see, no harm has come to you. Super spectronic relativity? I believe that's what you once called it. Oh, then you are familiar with my work. To some degree, yes. I read up on you this morning in the library after talking with the police. Oh. And what did you learn about me? Quite a bit. I know of your early career and some of the brilliant discoveries you made in the field of physics and that you were expelled from the International Congress of Physicists because of your theories. Oh, that was a humiliation which will soon be avenged, Mr. Crandall. But go on. What else did you learn of me? Well, I know that you were a friend and sponsor of Adolf Hitler, that you helped elevate him to power in the 30s, and became the organizer and administrator of his Department of Scientific Warfare. That's another thing that puzzles me, Herr Doctor. Why a man of your brilliance should identify himself with a fanatical madman like Hitler? How dare you refer to Adolf Hitler as a madman? He was a great genius, ahead of his time. The world in its ignorance was not ready to accept him. The world did not accept him because he was a lunatic bent on enslaving it. Do you call a man who is responsible for the mass murder of millions a great man, a genius? Anyone with enough intelligence to examine history knows there are times when lives must be sacrificed for the benefit of future generations. And he was willing to do this in order to lead his people into... Into darkness into oblivion. That's where he was leading them. And like all other power-crazed dictators before him, he failed. Thank God there were people in the world with enough courage to resist and to conquer him. What do you know in your stupid, petty little mind? You will forgive me, Mr. Crandall, for my outburst of temper. You are, of course, entitled to your own opinion for whatever small purpose it may serve you. Let me enlighten you, Mr. Crandall, on a few things of which you and the rest of the world are unfair. Blame for the loss of the war cannot be laid to Hitler or his doctrines. It was I who failed him. Me? And the general staff. He called for weapons, super weapons, to turn the tide of war in those last few days. Because of my inability to deliver those machines soon enough, we were defeated. It might interest you to know that during those last few months of the war, we had almost perfected weapons so far in advance of anything that had gone before them as to make modern warfare in all its forms completely obsolete. Oh, if you had only had time for further experiments. I know of some of your experiments, like the ones carried out in a certain concentration camp. Oh, then you know about the aging machine. Yeah, they had almost perfected that one when the war ended. Oh, that machine was one of the more primitive devices. 
like the jets and the rockets that we, we use so briefly. We were in the final stages, Mr. Crandall, of perfecting weapons that were truly astounding and against which you would have had no defense. A cannon that killed with sound waves, yet was completely silent. A giant generator gun that could electrocute whole armies in the field. Oh, and more, many more. If you'd have only had a few more months to perfect those weapons, we could have plucked victory from the jaws of defeat. The turret rice would have endured. Not for a thousand years, as the Fuhrer dreamed, but forever. But the fact is that you failed, Herr Doctor. Failed and lost. Oh, but you are forgetting one thing, Mr. Crandall. That was 20 years ago. Since then, I have perfected and even improved on my original weapons. And we have conquered time. Dr. Einstein's so-called fourth dimension. Hitler will return, Mr. Crandall, and soon your victory was but a temporary one. My own underground atomic power supply. Here are the master controls, and here are the selectors. With this dial, I can control the sensory I wish to deal with. These other dials, of course, are for the selection of the, the year, the month, the day, even the hours and minutes, and even seconds. These are the acceleration switches with which I can control the velocity or, or speed of the passage of certain relative segments of time. Just as you would increase or decrease the speed of an automobile. Is that too difficult for you to grasp, Mr. Crandall? Frankly, I'm beginning to doubt my sanity. Well, you needn't. After all, there are very few people in the world who can understand uh, even Dr. Einstein's theory of relativity. And my theories go far beyond his. Uh, but you are an intelligent man, Mr. Crandall. Uh, perhaps I can explain it a bit more simply. Even that this line represents the world. With a line here to represent the equator, the mark here and the mark here for the north and south poles. If an aircraft starts here, this side of the equator, and starts going up and up and up, it is going north, toward the north pole. But the instant it passes over the pole, it is no longer going north. It is going south. And yet, it has not turned or change its direction in any way. Now that is the simplest way I know of to make you understand how my theory of superspectronic relativity was first developed. It has long been established that time and space do not exist except in relation to each other. Therefore, they are inseparable, indivisible, a, a, a space-time continuum. The faster we travel in space, the faster we travel in time. Now, uh, let me use this short vertical line to represent an instant of time on this horizontal arrow to represent velocity or speed. 
Now then, scientists have long held that light is the top limiting velocity in the universe. In other words, there is nothing in the world faster than light. And yet it is known that beta particles ejected from the nuclei of radioactive substances can attain velocities up to 99% that of light. Now, I have always based my theories on the premise that there is no limit to space. The universe is limitless. Well, if there is no limit to space, then there is no limit to time and no limit to velocity. Therefore, I thought there must be something in the universe that was faster than light. <laughs> the years of frustration and failure before I finally had to submit to the one irrevocable fact there is nothing in the universe faster than light. But I discovered a new ray in the spectrum with a wavelength infinitely shorter even than that of the cosmic ray. This ray I called the minus ray. I'm afraid you lost me, Doctor. Well, in other words, while I discovered that the velocity of light is indeed the top velocity in the universe, that velocity need not remain constant. I discovered that through minus rays, velocity could actually be accelerated. And let me illustrate in this way. This line represents an instant in time. An instant, that is, in relation to our immediate vicinity in space. Now, if you enter a dark room on flip a switch, that room is instantly flooded with light. That is because that light, traveling at its great velocity, takes hardly any time at all to cover that small area of a room. It is immediate, instantaneous. Now, if that light had traveled any faster, it would have come on before you flipped the switch. Are you beginning to understand? I think so. Fine. Now then, just as I illustrated a moment ago, with the airplane flying up over the world, heading north until it passed over the North Pole, then its direction became south, the same thing is true in a sense of time. If the velocity of ordinary light, represented by this arrow, should be accelerated, then it will pass beyond the instant represented by this vertical line and no longer be moving in the direction of the future, but it will be moving in the direction of the past. It will no longer be going forward in time, but backward. The greater the velocity, or, or I should say, the greater the acceleration, the further back in time it will travel. In other words, if a guy left New York for Los Angeles and traveled fast enough, he'd get there before he started. In joke, Mr. Crandall, but crudely expressed, that is exactly what would happen. Why are you telling me all this? To impress upon you the superior scientific knowledge that we possess, my friend, and to illustrate why we would have won the war. If we had only had a few more months, we were the slaves of time then. Time was our master. But I, I have changed all that. Now, we are the masters, and time is our servant. Ah, oh, you Americans are an egotistical, arrogant lot. How proud and superior you felt as you strutted through the ruined streets of our cities. The proud conquerors claiming the spoils of war. But that 
is only temporary, my Yankee friend. Soon Hitler will return. We will rewrite history. And the Third Reich will endure. For a thousand years. Or a hundred thousand years. But forever. Immortality. The age-old dream of man is ours. The rest of the world will fall at our feet, and ye shall rule for all eternity. Oh, Lord. Did you uh, make the young ladies uh, comfortable? Yeah, boy, her doctor. And Mantra, did you see that Mr. Ma had a change of clothes? Yeah, boy. Good. The lecture is over, Mr. Crandall, and you look tired. If you will follow Monfler and Wolf, they will show you to your quarters. We weren't planning on staying. We want out of here now. I'm afraid that is impossible, Mr. Crandall. I must insist that you accept my hospitality. Now, wait a minute. Get your hands off! Thank you! Hauser, you can't get away with this! Are you all right? Oh, yes, we're, we're all right. Why are they locking us up? What are they going to do with us? Nothing, if I have anything to do with it. Oh, oh don't hurt him. Oh, don't hurt him. Is Margie still with you? Yes. She's asleep. Jim, I'm scared. What do you think Von Hauser intends to do with us? I don't know. But I do know one thing. I've got to figure a way out of here. Sandy, honey, I'm sorry about everything. I shouldn't have brought you with me this morning. It wasn't your fault. I asked to come along. After all we've been through, you must be beat. Have you had any sleep? No, I was worried about you. Well, try to get some rest while I do some thinking. Okay. As soon as Margie wakes up, I will. Gee. 
So you see, my dear, there, there was no reason for all that hysteria. You've really nothing to fear. Uh, while I have never before tried sending anyone into the future, there is no reason to believe that the experiment will not be successful. And if something should go wrong, it will happen so quickly, you'll never feel a thing. It is time you eat now. You speak English? Many others before you, they teach me talk. You mean there have been other prisoners here? Many. Are there any others here now? They all disappear. You eat now. It is all they give me for you. It's all right. At least it's better than nothing. Didi Alma, you've got to help us. You're our only hope. No. I cannot help you. But you've got to. You're the only one. If you could get hold no. of the keys. No. No. They'll kill me. I cannot help you. Please, Didiama, listen to me. No. We'll never get out of here if you don't help us. Please, Didiama. Please. I bring you food. You eat. Thank you. Sandy, see if you can persuade her to help us. It may be our only hope. What's it going to You're safe. Quick, get his keys. Oh, Jim, it was awful. He strangled her. It's all right, honey. Try to get a hold of yourself. We've got to get out of here. I'll be fine. It's useless. You will only tire yourself needlessly. Bring her back. I cannot guarantee that, Mr. Crandall. 
I have never experimented with the future before. You insane, sadistic. If you don't bring that girl back, I'll empty this gun into that warped brain of yours. Bad, Mr. Xander, that you are not interested in science. <laughs> but you Americans are so impractical anyway. should cut down on your time travel, my good doctor. How about the attic? You searched that, didn't you? Yes, sir. That's where we found the Nazi soldiers and the radar equipment. Then this house has some connection. Crandall's car was found not too far from here. Von Hauser's headquarters must be around here somewhere. Lieutenant? Where did you three come from? Von Hauser's country place, Fred. We spent a very interesting night there. Where is Von Hauser? Down there in his laboratory. Listen! What's that sound? That's the machine. You'd better stop it before he gets away. Lasky, you come with me. Then you stay here with them. What machine? The time machine. The what machine? Hold it right there. Get away from that machine. seen it with my own eyes, Lieutenant, I wouldn't believe it. I know, I know. I ask you if you ever tell anyone what I'm about to do, I'll have your job so help. Is that clear? Lieutenant, I ain't seen nothing. Well, I don't know what makes this contraption work, but I think I know a darn good way to shut it off. Fred. Forget it. 
Finley, call Miller headquarters. Have him send some of the boys out. Are you two all right? Everything's fine. Thank you, Lieutenant. Why don't you take the two ladies home? Come on, Lasky. The machine? Mangled beyond repair or recognition. Too bad the big brass didn't get a chance to look it over, isn't it? But why, Fred? You had no right. No right, huh? Listen, the way I figure is like this. Sooner or later, some other joker is going to invent a machine just like it. Maybe by then the world will be ready for it. God only knows we aren't now. Hydrogen bombs are enough for people to worry about. Yesterday should be left alone. Because today, the world has enough problems. Just trying to make sure we'll have a tomorrow.